Lord, we need you. Father, we thank you for your presence here today. We thank you, God, that we can come together and lift up our praises to you and receive from your word and fellowship with believers, Lord. And we just thank you for this wonderful day. And Lord, as Isaiah reminds us how when you send rain, it waters the ground to feed the plants. Lord, we ask, Holy Spirit, that now as we open up your word, we ask that you would, you would feed us, Lord God, and cause your, your word to grow, faith to grow, Lord God, in our lives, Father. Speak to us, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated this morning. Isn't this a, a great day? I mean, yesterday, the last few days, we were sweating, had too much sun. Now we got clouds. And only in Arizona, right? Praise the Lord. We're up to Luke chapter 10 in our study, going through Luke's gospel. I also want you to find a couple places in the Old Testament, if you would. We'll put them on the board. Isaiah chapter 14 and Ezekiel chapter 28. We'll look at a few scriptures in both of those places as we get through our study. And as you know, as we go through the Bible, the way, way we study it, systematically book by book and chapter by chapter verse by verse as, as we go through it like that I don't really name the lessons we just we, we go from the address and we go on but if I had to name today's lesson I would name it this what in the world are Christians supposed to do what in the world are Christians supposed to do the reason I titled it that is because in Luke chapter 10 we see three things that we as believers are supposed to do in the world. Verses 1 through 24, we learn that we are to be ambassadors for Christ to the world. We represent Him to the world as we do His will. Then the second thing we learn as Christians in verses 25 through 37 is that we are to be neighbors like Christ. Neighbors like Christ. We are to look for opportunities to show His love and His mercy and His kindness to those around us. And then as we close out the chapter, verses 38 through 42, we find that we are to, believe, to be lovers of Christ. We are to worship and honor and praise Him because He is our good and our mighty God. So, three things that Christians are to do in the world. We're to be ambassadors for Christ, neighbors like Christ, and lovers of Christ. All right, you guys find those? All right, well, let's start in our text in Luke chapter 10. And the first one we'll look at is being ambassadors for Christ. Let's start reading at verse 1. We'll read the first 11 verses, talk about it, and then we'll finish it up. So begin reading with me, verse 1. After these things, the Lord appointed 70 others also and sent them two by two before his face into every city and place where he himself was about to go. And he said unto them, The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go your way. Behold, I send you out as lambs among wolves. Carry neither money bag, knapsack, nor sandals, and greet no one along the road. But whatever house you enter, first say, Peace to this house. And if a son of peace is there, your peace will rest upon it. If not, it will return to you. And remain in the same house, eating and drinking such things as they give, for the laborer is worthy of his wages. Do not go from house to house. Whatever city you enter, and they receive you, eat such, such things that they set before you. And heal the sick there. And say to them, the kingdom of God has come near you. But whatever city you enter, and they do not receive you, go out into its streets and say, The very dust of your city which clings to us, we wipe off against you. Nevertheless, know this, that the kingdom of God has come near you. Let's stop right there. Of course, this goes on a few more verses. But let's talk about these first, and then we'll continue. Notice, if you would, please, uh, we see some great and important things that I think speak to our day today. And that is that... Uh, earlier in our study, we saw that, that we are to be sowers. Remember, the sower sows the word. And we're to sow the seed in all the, the grounds. He, the teacher gave us four different grounds that represented people's hearts, right? And we were to, to, to spread them out. Well, here we see that we are all ca called to be harvesters. Now, the harvest is a reference to the souls of people. And notice that it is an urgent call. The time to reap is now. Right? He says, now. Also notice, if you would please, that 
we are called to be laborers, not spectators. Laborers, not spectators. Notice also, if you would please, that the harvest is great. How many of you would agree that you just look around in the world outside today and there's a great need for God in our world, amen? There's a great need for the love and the mercy and the touch of God upon our planet. We can look at all different areas and, and we could apply this to everything. The world needs God. <laughs> right? The world needs the Lord. It's going crazy. We need God. And so it is a great harvest, but also notice, here's where you and I get faced with the challenge. The laborers are few. Sinners are great. Or I should say, they greatly outnumber believers. And non-active believers greatly outnumber active believers. And that's why we're called to, har to be harvesters. The harvest is urgent, just as a crop in our day has a certain time window that you got to get the crop in, or else, or else the the fruit of that crop is is uh, is destroyed, is not good. So we only have a specific number of time. Remember what their message is that the kingdom, that God is near, right? Uh, their message in that day was get ready, Jesus is coming. That's why he sent the seventy out, right? Why did he send them out to tell them Jesus is coming? Our message today is what. Get ready, Jesus is coming. <laughs> right? And that's going to be awesome because then we don't have to worry about it. Right? We just, just do this thing. But notice that the harvest can be very dangerous. Jesus makes it very clear that the miss mission will not always be rosy and cozy. But did you notice that Jesus didn't tell us to pray for an easier job, but to pray that he'll send more workers out? Right? Now, notice some, some things here. He tells us, oh, I, I found this fact out today. In the last few years, take a guess. Somebody, normally it's not good for a preacher to ask the audience to participate, but, but this, will, this will boggle your mind. In the last few years, few years meaning over 10, I only went back 10 years, guess how many Christian martyrs are martyred every year around our world? Any guesses? How many? 10,000? Go on, let's go on. 160,000 Christians a year are martyred. And with the rise of the Muslims and the communist countries, it's feared that this number is going to grow even greater. Friends, our mission is to the wolves, not to the sheep. Right? He said, I'm sending you out as sheep into the wolves. Our mission is to the wolves. That's kind of scary, right? Now, in verse 4, we see what Jesus told them not to take. Normally, we say, somebody says, you know, I have this burden from God. I want to do this from God. And we say, okay, well, you've got to have this much money. You've got to have this. You've got to have that, right? Jesus says, here's what you don't have to have. Check this out. Now, he says in verse 4, carry no money bag with you. Now, uh, if you're a preacher like me, you don't need a money bag. As I told Joey when he worked on my truck, he was working on my truck. I said, you know, I don't know what's wrong with it, but remember, I'm a poor preacher. And he said, I've heard you. I know. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> is he saying we shouldn't have some funds? No, what he's, Jesus is saying here is we need to depend upon God because if we wait till we make everything ready, we'll never go out in the field, will we? right? We'll, we'll, we will never be prepared to do it. That's why we have to depend upon the Lord. That's why we have to step out in faith. So he says, don't wait until your, your wallet is full, nor your knapsack. That just means extra stuff, right? We, we're to depend totally upon God, nor sandals. Now, what he's meaning here is don't be barefoot, but don't worry about having extra stuff. You just trust God and you do it. The number one thing that stops the work of God from, from, from being completed is a failure to start. Did you know that? A failure to start is number one reason works of God never gets completed. So uh, keep going. Greet no one. Well, I thought we were supposed to be ambassadors of love. We are, but in the Jewish, uh, in the Jewish 
day, they, they had a formal greeting that consisted of bowing and speaking words and doing all this stuff. And it was just, it was just, uh, d- just craziness. In fact, uh, I've got a scripture. I'm going to jump ahead to 2 Kings 4.28, Daryl, if you would. Uh, Elisha forbade his, his guy to, to greet people because the urgent message was, the message was so urgent. Check that. And he said to Gehazi, get yourself ready and take your staff in your hand and be on your way. If you meet anyone, do not greet them. Okay, you can say, sup, you know, high five them, but don't go through the whole long process that, that's going to take you 30 minutes, right? Don't greet them, and if anyone greets you, do not answer them. You know, if they start this, it may seem rude, but, but the work of God is important. You go about the work of God. Uh, don't answer them, but lay my staff on the face of the child. What he was doing, he was sending, uh, sending him to, to minister to a, uh, uh, a child that had had uh, passed away so that's what that's about now that's what he meant when he said don't waste time doing things that don't need to be done you stick to the message i've got some scriptures here also about us depending and 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 relying upon god psalm 37 3 and 5 37 3 says trust in the lord and do good dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. And then verse 5 of that same psalm says, Commit your way to the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. And then a very familiar one, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, is a great one. Uh, you probably heard it. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. And in all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. Okay? We can trust God for this important journey of laboring, because the harvest is great. But the laborers are few. You know, in the back there, we're slowly working on the thing where we're highlighting the different missionaries that, that we support. We have, we have a part in, in a harvest field around the world. Isn't that cool? And so, it's awesome what, what God is doing. It says in verse 5 here, this is very interesting. But wherever you enter a house, first say peace or shalom. To this house now this was the the usual uh, salutation when you'd go into a home and what's interesting is in verse 6 Jesus says and if a son of peace now in the Bible as in kind of our day if someone has a personality or or a, a quirk or something you'll say they're a son of that thing for example James and John were called sons of thunder because they wanted to call fire down on people right Uh, Judas was called the son of perdition in John 17 because uh, of of him betraying Jesus. So what he's saying here is if a son of peace, if a peaceful person is in this house, your peace will rest upon it. Friends, as an ambassador for Christ, as the Holy Spirit dwells in us, we will affect and bless other people that are around us if that person is open to the blessings right but if someone just wants to fight you and is negative and everything they're not going to experience the peace of God that you have because they're not allowing it to happen right now this is very cool Uh, uh, that's why Jesus said blessed are the peacemakers right but you need to be a peace receiver if you want to be a peace partaker does that make sense okay so if the person of the house there is a son of peace if they're peaceful people they're they're looking for the things of God The peace that you carry with you, being a child of God, will rest upon it. If not, it will return with you. I've heard a lot of people, and mostly it's it's ladies who get saved and they're squared away with God, and and their man isn't. And and you know we always tell them, hey, just show your love and and be a witness and all that. And they get frustrated. It's it's because the man isn't a man of peace yet. But you hang in there and you stay. You're in the job and you're the only one who's a Christian and they give you a hard time. You, you keep at it, right? Notice it didn't say cut and run. You just keep at it and let God soften their heart. And when they open up to peace, your peace will rest upon them. It says in verse 7, And remain in the same house. Now, they weren't to be jumping from house to house. The reason being is because they had this long ceremony of of coming and going and doing all that. You know, Uh, don't waste valuable ministry time in doing unvaluable stuff, I guess is how you would say it. Okay, so stay wherever they are. And it says, uh, eating and drinking is things that they give you. 
Now, a couple things in the mindset of a Jew is, first of all, uh, they didn't like being the recipients of charity. They wanted to be givers of charity. And Jesus says, hey, don't worry about it because the laborer is, is worthy of his wages. For the overhead, please, 1 Corinthians 9.14. Even so, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should live from the gospel. Okay? So, uh, a minister deserves to be paid. Right? Oh, come on! <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> I didn't ask for a jet. I just, I, I, I just asked for a Batmobile. That's all I asked for. So, all I want. The labor is worthy of his hired, so don't go from house to house, okay? That's what he's saying. Now, now uh, check this out, verse 8. Some of these missionaries might be invited to go into a Gentile's home, and they might not be, you know, living by the, the, the Levitical dietary laws. So he says in verse 8, Whatever city you enter and they receive you, eat such, such things as they set before you. 1 Corinthians 10.27 If any of those who do not believe invite you to dinner and you desire to go, eat whatever's set before you, asking no question for conscience' sake. Now, I had to repeat this verse a few times when I went to Brazil and Africa and, and sometimes to Mexico. <laughs> you know, you just eat it and, and go. You don't know what, you know, especially in Africa, they eat weird things there. In, in, in Brazil, they, they eat barbecue lizards and, you know, God provided it, so he says eat it. And, and the, the, the secret, no it doesn't. <laughs> Tastes like sick chicken. <laughs> you know. Come on from these mission trips, because like, man, you lost weight. Yeah, and I'm hungry. <laughs> but Jesus is saying, don't get caught up in that religious stuff. Eat what they feed you. You're ministering, you're serving the Lord. Uh, eat what's set set before you. Uh, you can tell this to your kids when you feed them healthy foods too. Verse 9. And heal the sick there. This is what their job. Their job isn't to, to, to complain about food. Their job is to heal the sick and say to them, the kingdom of God is co is, has come near you. Jesus is coming to town. The message of the gospel is what's important. You do the work of the gospel, heal the sick, cast out demons, do all this stuff, and you let them know that I'm coming is what Jesus said. That's still our job today, to minister to the needs of the people, to bless the people's needs, and, and to let them know that Jesus is coming back. Amen? That's the good news. Jesus hasn't forgot about us. He's coming. It says in verse 10 here, uh, if they don't receive you, how many of you know that... Uh, Rejection is a part of life. Not just in presenting the gospel, but sometimes we're just rejected as a person. If you're not received, then change the message so they'll buy your books and your tapes and keep paying you. No. Just because people reject the message of Jesus Christ, you don't change the message of Jesus Christ. Right? Right? The message is still, Jesus is near. The Jesus is still, your answer, your hope, your fulfillment is found in, in Jesus. The message is still Jesus. It's not do the best you can. It's Jesus, right? And the, so rejection doesn't change the message. It won't, uh, it won't change it. We don't change the message just because people don't like it and refuse it. Also note here that... Uh, just because the people refused the message didn't change the fact that God was near. Okay. Just because someone don't believe in this God stuff or this Jesus stuff doesn't mean Jesus ain't coming back. <laughs> it just means you're going to be really shocked. <laughs> right? <laughs> just because you don't believe in hell doesn't change the fact it's hot. Right? So just because they didn't accept the message, it didn't change the fact that Jesus was, was coming near. And also notice, just because they didn't believe the message, didn't rid them of the consequence of the message. Jesus still came to their town, right? And so, uh, it says here, what do we do when we're, when we're rejected, when they don't accept the gospel? Well, it doesn't mean we stop spreading the gospel. 
we just stop with them. We don't cast our pearls among swine, before swine. It says here, dust, dust the, the dust off of your pants and make sure that you, you let them know, hey, I've done my obligations here and uh, uh, I'm moving on. Verse 12. But I say to you, now check this out, when somebody, when a nation, when a person, when an individual, when a city, uh, when a government rejects God, check this out, verse 12. But I say to you, it will be more tolerable in that day. What day? The day that Jesus comes back. It will be more tolerable in that day for Sodom than for that city. Ooh. Wow. Sodom is... Is, is the ultimate illustration of bad. Right? I mean, we got fire coming down and, and disintegrating it and, and all this stuff, right? But the person who rejects the message of Jesus Christ, it's going to be better for Sodom than for that person, that town, that city, that nation. He says in verse 13, Woe to you, Chorazan, and woe to you, Bethsaida. Now, Chorazan, we don't know a lot about. It's the only time it's mentioned in the Bible. Bethsaida, we know a little bit about. But here we learn some stuff. It says, For if the mighty works which were done in you, so we know that Jesus had been there, that God had moved there, that stuff had happened there in these cities. But we also learn here that they rejected that. For if the mighty works that were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, these were historically wicked, wicked cities that rejected God. And here Jesus is saying is if what you people saw on your day, if they would have saw in the ancient day, they would have repented long ago sitting in sackcloth and ashes. Just like the Ninevites, if they would have, if they would have seen what you've seen, they would have responded to it. Now let me ask you guys this. In our day and age, in our technology, we've got television, we've got radio, we've got shortwave, we've got, uh, do they still use CB radios? <laughs> they do? Uh, uh, the internet, our, our smartphones and tablets, stuff like that. You've got to try hard not to get the gospel. Right? So how much worse will people of this world be that has free access to God than these people that only depended on, on these, these anointed men that walked around? See what I'm saying? Woe unto you, America. If you don't repent in sackcloth and ashes. It says verse 14, But it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the judgment than for you. Not only are individuals going to be judged, but it, according to this, as people groups. And to you, Capernaum. Now, this is interesting because Capernaum is criticized in particular because Jesus ministered there a lot. Just in the Gospel of Luke, up to this point, check this out. I just kind of went through this. I might have missed some. But here we see that Jesus was teaching in their synagogues, chapter 4. Healing the centurion servant, chapter 7. Uh, Peter's mother-in-law was healed, chapter 4. Uh, paralytic, chapter 9. Raising Jairus' daughter, chapter 8. So Jesus did a lot in Capernaum. And so here Jesus has said, And you, Capernaum, who are exalted to heaven, whatever happened there, they thought they were a pretty uh, lofty city. They thought they were it, right? What's very dangerous is when a person doesn't think they need Jesus and they can get to heaven on their own. That's a very dangerous situation. I don't care what Oprah or Joel Olstein or any of them people say, Jesus is our way to heaven, right? And here he says, you think you're exalted to heaven, but you're going to be brought down to Hades. Gulp. Then he's telling these guys that he's sending out that it's dangerous. you got to depend on me. Some people will receive you. Some people won't receive you. All this stuff. He says in verse 16, He who hears you hears me. It's a very important job to be a spokesman for the Lord. And that doesn't just mean if you stand at a pulpit. When we're representative of the Lord, we're representative for the Lord, right? He who hears you hears me. He who rejects you rejects me there'll be rejection because of God but they're actually rejecting God and he who rejects me rejects him who sent me so they're not just rejecting you they're rejecting Jesus they're not just rejecting Jesus they're rejecting the father 
right? Now, he sends the, the guys out. We don't know how long, what the uh, time period was between verse 16 and 17, but check it out. And the 70 returned with joy. Okay, they went out with maybe a little fear because they couldn't take money, saddles, saddles, <laughs> sandals. <laughs> don't have a horse, don't need a saddle, I guess. Uh, you know. So they might have went out with a little fear because, you know, we're going to get rejected and got to eat monkey hands and all this other weird stuff, and right? But they come back with joy. Whenever you do something for God, there's always joy, right? Especially serving in the children's church. I always got to throw that in there, you know. Just, just, you know. Here's what they're all excited about. Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. Now that is pretty cool, right? But listen what Jesus, he gives us a great, a great lesson on demons. He says, I saw Satan fall. This word fall isn't like he just stumbled and crashed. Fall means to, to lose authority, to lose placement, right? To lose standing. I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Now, I ask you to, to look at some scriptures. Look, first of all, at Isaiah chapter 14. Let's talk about this. This is some interesting scriptures we're going to look at. Excuse me just a second here. You guys there? Okay. Isaiah, Isaiah 14, let's start reading at verse 12. How you have fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. Lucifer, devil, Satan, whatever word you want to use him. Uh, he, was, he was one of the, um, one of the uh, archangels. His name was Lucifer. He was the son of the morning. How you were cut down to the ground. You who weaken the nations. For you said in your heart, here's, we think only people can be prideful. Angels can too. You said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest side of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. Check out what he says here, the first, what he's promised Eve. I will be like the Most High. Yet you shall be brought down to Sheol into the lowest depths of the pit. We learn from the book of Revelation that, that he's going, he went from heaven and he's going to the pit. Now Ezekiel chapter 28. read a few verses here. You guys there? We'll read beginning at verse 11. Moreover the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre. Here the king of Tyre in this is uh, speaking of Satan and this will come into effect as, as we read this. Uh, Jeremiah 4 also backs this up. Take this lamentation up for the king of Tyre and say to him, Thus says the Lord, You were the seal of perfection full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Now, this is even before Adam and Eve. Every precious stone was your covering. And he names now nine stones. Interesting, these same stones were in the breastplate of the high priest. Very interesting. Uh, I'm still in verse 13. The workmanship of your timbrels and your pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. Here we see Lucifer, Satan, the devil. He was created for worship. He was in charge of, of the worship and praise of God. You were the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of the fiery stone. So he had a very important job. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created. Please note that Satan is a created being. 
He wants you to think he's a God. There's some religions that teach he's a God. He's a created being. Until iniquity was found in you. What was that iniquity? Well, the pride. Right? By the abundance of your trading, you became filled with violence within, and you sinned. Therefore, I cast you as a profane thing. A profane thing means something that is, is profane. <laughs> it, it, it actually means unholy. Unholy. Out of the mountain of God. And Jesus said, I saw this happen. And I destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the fiery stones. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I laid you before kings that they may gaze at you. And we can stop there and go back to our, our text in Luke. But here Jesus was referring to that when he says, you guys are so impressed that they're, they're subject to you. That shouldn't impress you. That happened long ago. Right? That's, that's just part of, of it. Friends, in chapter 9, verse 1 of the same book, we learned and we saw how Jesus gave to us the power and the authority over the demonic world, right? He's given us the authority in the name of Jesus. He goes on to tell them here in verse 19 of our text, Behold, I give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions. That's illustration of the demonic world and the different levels of the demonic world. And over all, that word there, all, is all. The power of the enemy. Now, this doesn't mean he won't put up a fight. But we are the victors. Right? Give you power over all the power of the enemy. And nothing shall be by any means hurt you. Isn't that great? Doesn't mean he won't try. Doesn't mean he won't fight. But you have the victory, friends. In the name of Jesus, we have it. Now, again, not to make you think anything different of me, but I've had some direct experience with demonic activity. And it's not pleasant. They, they are stubborn. They do want to fight. But we win. We have the authority. I use this example uh, t talking about authority. But picture, if you will, I just think it's a great picture. Picture Barney Fife. Right? Just not your pick. <laughs> okay, say you got a fight. And you can pick one co-fighter, and your choices are Arnold Schwarzenegger or Barney Fife. <laughs> Who are you going to pick, right? You're going for Arnie, right? But now in the spiritual realm, we might be Barney Fife's. But because we have that badge that he got to, right, that's where the authority comes from. And because we are Jesus' children, we're the children of the King, we have the name of Jesus and the authority and the power of the Holy Spirit in us. We have that authority, right? cool so I just in my mind I don't know how you guys do it but I always kind of picture this stuff out to because I don't know that's just the way I always do it but I always I, always, <laughs> I probably shouldn't confess this because I'm looking all holy but I always see Barney Fife and I hear the Kung Fu fighting song and I, I watch him do this you know. <laughs> that would be a good movie though wouldn't it Barney Fife Ninja Mayberry Ninja that would be just, Anyway, he pulls us back into what's really important, and that's verse 20. They're all excited because the demons do what they say, and, and they're healing sick and doing all this. And Jesus says, hey, let's don't forget the important thing. That's in verse 20. Don't rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Friends, salvation is still the greatest gift God has given us. And in this world, we're, we're going to have struggles. We're going to have problems. We're going to have attacks. We're, things are going to happen. As long as, long as we're in this body, those things are going to happen. But our names are forever written in heaven. And we can, we, can, we can be happy and rejoice in that. This took me a little bit longer than I thought. But let's... let's uh, um, I'm going to go. I'm, I'm, I'm going to keep on going. Look at this next thing. That was... Um, well, let's finish up. Verse 21. And in that hour, after they come back and they're rejoicing and everything, Jesus was rejoicing. He was thanking the Father for their successful trip. And he says, I thank you, Father, Lord of, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and the prudent and revealed them to babies. Even so, Father, for, for so it seemed good in your sight. 
All things have been delivered to me by my Father, and no one knows who the Son is except the Father, and who the Father is except the Son, and the one to whom the Son wills to reveal it. And of course, he re willed to reveal that to you and I, and these 70 and all that, right? I like this next verse, 23. And he turns to the disciples, all the 70 and everything, and he says to them, Blessed are the eyes which see the things that you see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings have desired to see what you see and have not seen it, and to hear what you hear and have not heard it. You know, I many times, in, my, in the theater of my mind, I, I try to visualize Moses standing at the Red Sea and the Red Sea parting. And, and I long for home movie night in heaven to see that. That would just be awesome, right? Uh, and, and to see the ten plagues and, and the, the Shekinah glow of glory would just be awesome, right? And, and, and I've often imagined myself being with Joshua and, and, and hearing the sounds and feeling the rumbling when the walls of Jericho fell down. Just fascinating stuff, right? Uh, or, or these prophets of old or Daniel and all this. Just fascinating stuff. But here Jesus is saying, those guys wish they were you. We've got it even better than that cool stuff because we have the full revelation of Jesus Christ. We have his word that he's given to us. We have his Holy Spirit that he's he sent to us and we have the authority of his name. Jesus is saying, you know, them, them, them heroes of old that you read about in, in Hebrews 11, yeah, they did some cool things, but they're envious of you. So friends, if they're envious of us, why don't we take up that mantle and go out into that harvest field because the laborers are few. And God is looking for laborers. And that's a good word for it because it can be laborious. It can be challenging. But it is so rewarding. So rewarding. Well, I want to stop there today. I was going to finish the chapter, but we just don't have time today. So you get out a little bit early. You're either going to get out really early or really late. <laughs> so, so we'll go the early. Let you guys enjoy the rest of this day. Let's stand and pray. Worship team, join me up here, please. If God has laid a challenge on your heart, we might call it a challenge. God calls it a call. And you've been just really not sure about it. That's normal. But let me assure you that God has made the way for you. You don't, have, you don't have to make it successful. You just have to be faithful. He's promised the success, right? So today, if, if, if God has been stirring with you to do something, to step out into that, that harvest field for something, today would you do it? Would you commit to God to make that step? Let me tell you, you'll be in for the adventure of your life, and it'll be so awesome and so cool. God wants to do some great things with you, for you, and through you. Amen? All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for your word that we can study it, that we can glean from it. And Father, I would pray as I pray always that you, Holy Spirit, would continue this lesson. Lord, I pray for each and every one of us that we would meditate on this portion of Scripture, these, these events we read about. And Lord, would you speak to us individually? Lord, make application to to each of us. It could be something that I never even spoke of today, Lord God, but you can reveal it to us and you can, you can minister it to us. Father, I pray for that one or those ones who maybe have been struggling with the call on their life and have been a little fearful. And, and Lord, maybe today they saw that they just need to trust you with all those things, Lord God. You, you haven't called us to go hungry and to go without but you told us to go out in faith, trusting you to supply. So we do that today, Lord. Father, there may be some here today that need to be the recipients of that message. Maybe we've never asked you to be the Lord and Savior of our life, and, and we're tired of struggling on our own and fighting on our own. Lord, maybe we have made you our Lord, but we're, we're facing great fear right now. We're facing uncertainty. And today we've been challenged to, to trust you again. Lord, whatever it would be, would you answer all questions? Would you meet every need? Would you break every chain today? Father, today would you do great and mighty things in our midst? Lord, we would ask that today in the mighty name of Jesus, Lord God, that, that you would just flood us and, 
and call the urgency of your harvest into our hearts, Lord God. Father, we thank you for what you're doing in our midst and allowing us to be part of it. Lord, we pray these things now in Jesus' name. Amen.